sister, and friend. Janelle, who I once called the little sister of my childhood best friend, has since grown into a bright and talented young woman. She graduated from Oakwood University in 2013 with a degree in pre-physical therapy. And then she received her doctorate from the University of the Pacific in physical therapy, a piece of her past that jumpstarted her to her future. She currently works at Northwestern Hospital as a pelvic physical therapist in the urogynecology department in Chicago, Illinois. If you thought this wasn't keeping her busy enough, she serves as a Sabbath school director at Silo SDA. She is also active on social media, educating her peers as well as her community in regards to the female pelvis. As she travels around the world, educating people about their worth, health, and to Christ, I am all too excited to see what she has in store next. Dr. Janelle Howell. Amen. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. The Savior now to wash our feet now. Spirit, I'm gonna rise 
from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me in your name. I come alive, I'll declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. Oh, oh he's resurrecting me. The tomb where soldiers watched in vain was borrowed for three days. His body there would not remain. Our God has wrought the grave. Your name, your name is victory all praise will rise to christ our king your name your name is victory all praise will rise to christ our king by your spirit i will rise yeah And I found peace because you're alive, you're resurrecting me. Yeah, our resurrected King, we're made alive in you, resurrecting us. Yeah, yeah. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I am so alive just because of that song. So I want to just let you know, Jessica Davidson, thank you so much for that beautiful song. Um, a big shout out to Deandra for the introduction. It was well polished, y'all. I just threw it to her. It was not like that. But the way she put that together, um, that, that was a beautiful introduction. Um, also, just want to thank um, uh, our pastors, Pastor Clark, Pastor Taylor, for, for leading the congregation in such an uncharted time of history, you know, trying to figure out the pandemic and, and how we continue to go on in the midst of COVID. So thank you for your leadership. Um, I also want to just acknowledge the family of Miss Holman. We know that she has passed on. I mean, all of our seasoned adults, you know, you're, you're like the cayenne pepper. I know we're, um, it's young adults today, but we appreciate our older adults too. We appreciate that that garlic powder and that cayenne, uh, our seasoned uh, veterans, we appreciate you. So um, thank you to everyone who is here um, and supporting me. Um, I appreciate you tremendously. I am uh, especially excited to, to speak today because you know, it's Black History Month and I'm excited and thankful for this responsibility uh, that was given to me uh, by, by you all. And so I do wanna encourage you all though, to be very active in the chat. I cannot see anyone. Um, I'm actually looking at Ms. Elder Finley's screen. So <laughs> that's what I see right now. So it will help me if something uh, speaks to your heart during the service, go ahead and chat. Uh, send something in the chat, a reaction, so that we can engage with each other um, today. And so the topic that I am really just thankful and excited to think about um, is Black mental health and wellness. And that has really definitely gained some traction over the years. 
I know when I think of that, I think of like maybe sitting in a chic office with a black psychologist discussing my childhood, you know, maybe have a vanilla latte in hand and then leaving that, that day going to, to pick up a green smoothie, then going to bed early that night, reading the book of Psalms. You know, this is the picture that I have when I think of black mental health and wellness. But what I want to show you uh, from the Bible is that godly wellness looks a little bit differently than what we may think of it to be. I want to suggest to you all that the road to godly wellness can sometimes be very dark. It can be numb and it can be a, a steep uphill battle. But it's the only road that will lead you to Jesus. So I've entitled my sermon for today, Wellness Ain't Pretty. Wellness ain't pretty. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we ask for your spirit to be here with us, Lord. Help this not just to be another service. Lord, I ask that you would speak to our hearts and move us to action. Lord, move us to express the things that you teach us and the things that you show us so that we can live your word to people who need to see it in action, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, you all, so we're going to Numbers 14, verses 3 and 11. Numbers 14, verse 3 and 11, and again, thank you to, to the people I see in the chat. That's really helping me, believe it or not. Let's turn there now. Numbers 14, 3 and 11. When you get there, I need you to drop something in the comment. Drop a heart in the comment when you get to Numbers 14, verses 3 and 11. If you have a Bible, don't leave your Bible on your desk. I need you to pick up the word of God with me this morning. Numbers 14, verse 3 and 11. And I will read in your hearing. And it says, why is the Lord taking us to this country? only to have us die in battle. Our wives and our little ones will be carried off as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? Verse 11, and the Lord said to Moses, how long, how long will these people treat me with contempt? Will they never believe me? even after all of the miraculous signs I have done among them. What we're reading is the experience of, of these people of color, these colored Israelites who have journeyed in the wilderness for decades after being led out of slavery, you all. You all know the story how God delivered them from Pharaoh and from those slave masters through miracles. They were delivered from oppression in Egypt. These are the Israelites that saw God bring plagues on the Egyptian land. These are the colored people who saw God make the Red Sea stand up like soldiers so that they could walk through it like it was a sidewalk. These were the people that saw their slave masters drown in the sea on their horses while they crossed over on dry land. These are the people who saw God follow them year and year out in the cold nights by a fire, in the daytime by a cloud. But when they got close to the health and wellness that God had in mind for them in Canaan, they reverted back to their slave mentality. Wouldn't it have been better for us to be back in Egypt, they said. They knew what God told them that he would bring them to a land where they could worship him freely without masters, without beatings, with ownership, with prosperity. But they were comfortable in their prior life. They were not comfortable necessarily being a slave, but they got comfortable thinking like one. If you go back in your free time to Numbers uh, chapter 11, verses four to six. Get this, you all. These Israelites were sitting there in the wilderness complaining, not just complaining, but crying about the meat they used to eat when they were slaves. Whining about literally cucumbers. 
that used to eat while they were slaves. These are grown adults sitting around crying about their former lives as slaves. It, it sounds ignorant, but this is what it is. Yeah, that was beautiful though, but yeah. Um, so, so what we're seeing now is that, that they are being led to, to a wellness that God has in mind, but they're complaining about the fried chicken that they used to get in Egypt. They're complaining about all those easy pleasures that they used to have. Then in chapter 13, after inspecting the land of Canaan, after they went out and looked to see what the land would look like that God was drawing them to. Before they would overtake this land in battle, they got scared when they saw how tall the buildings were, how tall the people were. Y'all, I want y'all to imagine with me right now that, you know, we're Huntsvillians and we're trying to overtake New York City. So we send out Elder Finley, Elder Getfield, and Elder Quentin Jones to size up NYC and bring us back report of what it really looks like before we try to overtake NYC. And so these three elders, they come back defeated, discouraged, and down about what they saw, believing that they could not defeat that city. So then they came back. And they give the Israelites a horrible report. Imagine those three elders coming back to Mount Calvary saying, those New Yorkers, they're dangerous. We're Huntsvillians. We can't overtake them. The city is too big. The people are too tall. Even though God had already told them that we would overtake this land. Imagine that. They were so focused on the things that they saw that they could not embrace the vision God gave. I want you this morning to forget about all the things that are right in front of your eyes for a second. Satan, it's his plan to have you so distracted by all the things that you see that you'll forget about all the things God has told you to do with your life. And this is the first mindset that we have to, to endorse if we want to reclaim Black mental health. Number one, we have to ignore all the stuff we see and embrace the vision Jesus has given to us. Vision is a mindset. You can't depend on your sight. Vision is spiritual. Sight is physical. And the only way to ignore the things we see is to cancel, cancel this complaint culture. Someone put that in the chat. Cancel the complaint culture. Cancel that. This culture, the, the complaining culture, will have you complaining about your boss, complaining about going to work, complaining about actually having a job, complaining about how much debt you have, complaining about how many bills you have, which means that you probably have a house, complaining about how much weight you've gained, complaining about how much the young people uh, don't do, complaining about who isn't at church, complaining about what your wife or husband doesn't do, complaining that you don't have enough clothes. And that is right where Jesus is not. You can't embrace the vision that Jesus has given to you without the mindset that Jesus has. Jesus is not into complaining. Philippians 1 says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. And that is a mindset of selflessness, not complaining about what you have to sacrifice and what you've got to do. Our God is not into complaining and it is the quickest way to not only lose sight of the vision that God has for you, but to waste time sizing up your problems instead of setting up your solution. You will find yourself complaining about all the different things that you have to do, all the different responsibilities that you have, all the different health problems that you have, all the different exams that you have, that you have to take. That is a scheme of the devil to have you focusing on your problems instead of sizing up your solution. Every time you sit around complaining about your health, about anything, 
those negative thoughts, those habits and behaviors are reinforced, giving the devil ammunition to keep you scared, discouraged, and defeated. To embrace the vision God has for you, you'll need to have a funeral for this complaining culture. You'll need a team though. Uh, I said, you'll need a team to do that. You can't cancel the culture around you without a team helping you to do that. These folks had literally crying parties. If you go into this chapter, you'll see that they got together and they started crying together. They were weeping and crying all night, crying about the cucumbers, crying about the chicken, crying about everything that they used to have crying about when they saw the Canaanites, crying when they saw the Amalekites. They were literally gathering together and passed the tissue so that they could wind together. They were used to living a life of familiar slavery in Egypt. And now they were using the community of complaint culture to gas up their excuses, their fears, and validate, validate their lack of vision. I want to tell you, sis, if you're listening to this, don't you call up your girlfriend and stay on and stay on the stay on the stay on the phone? Tyrone played you, and he doesn't call you, and he doesn't text you, and you're still single, and you've been single for ten years. Let me tell you to throw the tissue in the toilet and start getting around some courageous women of God that move towards the places God is calling them to. Not sitting in a vibrating chair, allowing Satan to keep you comfortable in a room that has no doors of opportunity. And this is what Moses had to do. He had to stay close to Aaron. He stayed close to Caleb. You'll see that later on in the chapter, right? He stayed close to Joshua because they were men of faith who believed in a big God and they believed in prayer. See, there's a reason why God led them by one pillar of fire at night. Have you ever thought about why God led them by one pillar of, of fire by night? Our God could have gave every single family one lantern, one candle. Each family could have had their own candle that never went out to guide each and every family. But no, God made it so that there was only one pillar of fire so that they had to stick together so that no one could drift off in the night, so that no one could go off to the side, so that no one can become discouraged. They were all one group. That was the plan, at least, that God had for them. And instead of using that ammunition, that family to be encouraged, they use that time to cry. They use that group to complain. They use that, that congregation to, to pass the, their tissues along so that they could continue gassing each other up and validating their lack of vision. But let me just warn you that when you start to think you don't need the people around you, when you think that you don't need your Christian friends or when you don't need this Christian organization's of believers to cover you and join you and praise with you, then you have resorted to a candle to guide you when you could have just stayed with the group and been led by a fire. God says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be with you in the midst. So I'm encouraging you, keep going to church. You need to be surrounded by holy, by God-driven people, by passionate people of God in order to keep moving forward. That's what Moses had to do. He got on the ground with Caleb and he prayed. They held tight to the vision God had for them. And they, uh, they learned Moses, Caleb, Joshua, to ignore the things they saw by shutting down the, the complaints and spending their time in, in the courageous company, even, the, even if that courageous company was only a select few. I remember when I first moved from California to Chicago uh, three years ago, it was my first year here and it was lonely. It was super cold. I was almost depressed, but I was able to stay distracted because I was in residency. So my career had all my focus. I was getting my, um, my residency training in women's health physical therapy. But then the next year when I finished, I was so excited to move from that apartment and get a new place. But it was in that transition time that I found myself completely isolated. My intention was to just get an Airbnb for a couple of months. And, but the thing is, when I got to the Airbnb, it was nothing like what I saw online. 
It was in a basement. It was a bed smaller than the one I slept on when I was 10. That thing had no windows. It was like I was in a prison cell. And while I was there for those two months, I didn't have that social interaction. I didn't have those encouraging words. I didn't know anyone really in Chicago. And, and it was really a depressing environment for me. And all I had was my thoughts there. And it wasn't, it wasn't good thoughts. It was just lonely. And I eventually ended up becoming roommates with someone named Sabrina, who I went to college with, Oakwood College. And we both moved into a two bedroom, two bath apartment in the South side of Chicago. The, the thing about this was that Sabrina was down to earth sassy, but she was a Christian woman. On Sabbaths, I hear her with the gospel music on in the morning. In the middle of the week, she'd be going to Wednesday night service. On the weekends, we would watch different movies uh, with, with, with Priscilla Shearer. We both even started a prayer closet and we were feeding off of each other's energy. And it was that courageous company that I had to get around to enable me to embrace the vision of godly wellness that was really my birthright. Because Satan knows full well what happens when we don't have courageous people around us to pump us up. And Jesus knows exactly what happens when we do. This is why the word says in Hebrews 3.13, exhort one another's daily, every single day, encourage someone in the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, encourage one another and build each other up. Even Jesus, while he was gasping for his last few breaths on the cross, he said to John the disciple and to his mother, he said, woman, behold your son. To John, he said, behold your mother. Y'all, all the bitterness, all the anger, all the complaining, it annoys the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is our helper. So I'm not suggesting that you cancel every one of your friends and go find new ones because that song is too often sung. I'm suggesting that you be the modern Moses. You be the modern Caleb. You determine to affect, infect those around you with some tenacity in the face of tragedies, with some integrity in the face of irresponsibility, with some purpose in the face of impurity and pornography, with some meekness in the face of a me society. When or if you can't find company of courageous people, don't sit in a corner and make the gospel a secret. Create a company of courage by embracing the vision God has given to you for your life by doing what he has already told you to do with your life. So the next step we have to take on the road to godly wellness is to neglect all pleasure outside of divine purpose. Ooh, 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 that one. That one right there. If we are going to achieve the vision that God has for us, we have to realize that even things that God have, has made, he, he is the one that's made pleasure. If it is outside of the purpose that God has for us, we have to neglect that. Because the Israelites were, were eating these plain crackers that Jesus was sending down, that God was sending down before he came flesh, before he became Jesus, son of God. Sending these, these crackers down. And they didn't have all the sugar. They probably didn't have the garlic powder. You know, it was some bland, maybe. And the Israelites were eating these crackers in the, in the wilderness, and they were craving more pleasurable experiences that they had when they were slaves. Numbers 11, verse 4 says they were crying about who would bring them meat, who would bring them some turkey, some chicken, some, some, some bacon. Thinking back, on that and how they used to eat the onions and the cucumbers, but they didn't understand, hear me y'all, they didn't understand that all pleasure outside of God's purpose eventually will lead to pain. And all pain in the midst of God's purpose will eventually lead to pleasure. Hey, somebody should have just got encouraged right there. So while they were no longer slaves, they still thought like slaves, they did not have the mindset to take accountability for the responsibility. They now had to embrace the vision. Let me tell you that when God shows you light, when you do Bible study, when you hear that sermon, when God shows you the truth, 
You now have a responsibility. Y'all, you have it to walk in your purpose. You have a business plan now. You have a vision. You have a course of action. But they were just used to this familiar lifestyle of food that hits the spot in a predictable job that they could depend on. And while this wilderness, while in this wilderness for, for decades, with the spirit of the living God right there in the midst of them, they did not have a spiritual mindset. I need you to understand that simply being in the presence of God will not make you practice the mindset of God. Woo! Some of us have been in the church for decades, simply going to church and being in his presence. I'm telling you that simply praying with a friend and feeling his presence, simply reading the Bible and feeling his presence is not the same as practicing his mindset. Exodus 13 verse 21 said that God was in the midst of them by a cloud during the day. Every single day for all those years, God's presence was with them. At night, he was with them by the fire. But if you don't ask God to help you move from merely being in his presence to practicing his mindset, which means choosing to think and do what God commands and starving the desires of what your selfish self wants you to think and do, then you will never experience, you will never experience the vision and the blessings and the benefits. I'm telling you all, there are benefits to committing to the vision that God has for you. But if you don't move from simply being in the presence of God all the time to practicing the mindset of God, you won't experience that. It's this mindset of denying our selfish desires and elevating God's purpose elevating God's purpose over our lives that allows us to get to that vision that he has for us. So, so the Israelites were not just eager to experience temporary pleasures again. They were not just discouraged about the giants that they didn't believe they could defeat, but they said they would have rather died in Egypt. Y'all listen to this. They saw the miracles already. They saw God do everything. They, they saw God show up by fire. They knew who God was. They had that true religion, y'all. They were, they were Jewish people. They were the Israelites. They didn't just want to experience the pleasure. They wanted to die in the wilderness. They wanted to have died in Egypt. Y'all hear me. The children of Israel were depressed. We're talking about black mental health and wellness. The children of Israel were depressed after seeing all the miracles, after seeing God move by fire, after seeing him part the Red Sea. The children of Israel were struggling with their mental health. You ever got to the place where you wish you were not even born? Y'all, this is what it had gotten to. You ever got to the place where you feel low, where you question your very worth, your value, your purpose in life? You ever cried at night? thinking that you don't even know if you want to be here. Y'all, this is what they were going through. They wanted to be dead. Struggling through suicidal ideations and going through a mental health challenge before there was a psychologist chair to sit in. That was the Israelites. Y'all, they were struggling. The thing with pleasure is that there is no effort that must be put in with pleasure. Getting drunk all the time, that's easy. Eating six slices of pizza, I can attest, that's easy. Laughing your guts out about someone who may look crazy, that's easy. Cheating on your partner, that's easy. Laying on the couch all day, that's easy. This stuff takes no effort, no challenge, no work. That's just all dopamine, all oxytocin, all serotonin, no stress hormones involved in pleasure. And they were married to a life of comfort and familiar familiarity. They didn't want to work to inhabit Canaan. They didn't want to, to practice what God was saying for them to inhabit Canaan. They didn't want to go to war. They didn't want to go up against these giants, not because they were afraid of failure, but because they were afraid of struggle. Y'all hear me now. They were not afraid of failure. 
They were afraid of the struggle it would take to get there. And today, look, if you're still resorting to partying and alcohol when you know you don't want to do that, then you're not afraid of failure on the other side. You're afraid of the struggle to overcome that and get to the other side. If you're still resorting to putting off school and applying to college and, and, but you hate the predictable job that you have right now, you're not afraid of failure because you feel failure right now, maybe. You're afraid of the struggle to return back to school. And if you still resort to avoiding your loans, your credit cards, your, your student debt, but you're still eating out, shopping every day, buying knickknacks on Amazon, it's not that you're what, what you're afraid of. It's the struggle to overcome that mentality that you're afraid of. Y'all, the road to godly wellness must include struggle because the struggle is God's way of navigating our spiritual cars to his home. Don't be afraid of the struggle. God did not have to send the Israelites through the wilderness for all these years. God did not have to tell Satan to consider Job as a laundry basket for the devil to dump family death, sickness, abandonment onto. God did not have to place Jonah in the belly of a whale to get him to listen to the assignment. And God did not have to have Jesus hanging on a cross with nails in his hands and feet for him to die in our place. But this is the Christian road to divine wellness. If the road you're on does not include some struggle, I suggest that it's not a Christ-led road. If you encounter no difficulty on the day-to-day, -day, if you encounter no guilt after you say those cutting words to someone, if you encounter no remorse after you leave her house that night, if you don't have to tell yourself to stop and listen to that homeless person trying to get your attention on the street, if you very easily, without any struggle, pass across a broke person with a cardboard sign and have no compassion, no struggle at all, then that is not a road to godly wellness. Jesus said, whoever wants to be my follower, if you really want to call yourself a Christian, this is what Jesus says in Luke 19 verse 10. You've got to give up your own way. You've got to struggle. You've got to take up your own cross and follow me. He said, you've got to do that daily. It's the struggle that the Israelites were afraid of to get to Canaan. They didn't want to struggle to get there. They wanted it handed to them. So stop telling yourself that you're afraid of failure. You may already be experiencing failure right now. We fail if we don't try, and we may fail even if we do try. But when we don't try, there's no struggle. When you are embracing the vision and not the things on your cell phone, not the things in your environment, not the worldly success, not the vanity of popularity, not the drugs of purpose, purposeless pleasure, then you will be committed to Christ and courageous company. And you will learn to reject all forms of pleasure outside of your purpose. The very last step that we must take if we want to embrace the cloud above us, which is his presence and his vision, is to reject faith that you feel. Uh, I'm going to say that again. Reject faith that you feel and practice a faith you walk uphill. These Israelites only believed as long as they were amazed, only believed as long as God did magic tricks in front of them. Does that sound familiar? Only at church when you recover from COVID. Only listening to gospel music when you got uh, the promotion. Only giving the testimony when you passed the class you didn't study for. We have been bamboozled into thinking that faith is something we feel. But faith is not an emotion. Faith is not an emotion. Faith is a movement towards a person. The Bible says walk by faith. The Bible says that faith without works is dead. God was not bringing the Israelites to Canaan just so that they could have honey on their toast. God was not bringing the Israelites to Canaan so that they could heal the scars on their back. Nor was he bringing them to Canaan just so that they could say they were no longer slaves. Now God was moving them to Canaan because he was moving them to himself.
God says in Exodus 19, verse four, this is God speaking. You've seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. The road to godly wellness will have obstacles and typically one big and loud right in front of you. Let me tell you that God has the power to move that obstacle out of the way, but he does not always remove the obstacle, nor does he always show us the way around the obstacle. Many times God calls us to walk through the obstacle. The Bible says through the fire and through the floods, through the fire and through the floods, he will be with us. When the Israelites rejected Canaan and rejected that vision God gave to them, they weren't just rejecting a new hometown. They were rejecting Jesus. They were rejecting God. So Numbers 14, verse 11, scripture for today, is God speaking and he's saying, how long will these people reject me? And God is asking us the same question today. How long will you reject me? How long will you reject the things I've I've shown you? How long will you reject the word of God while he is trying so hard to save you? How long? God calls you to reject the feel-good faith. Stop waiting for an explosion of spiritual energy to pray, to read your Bible, to invite people to church to call people and pray with them, to to start that ministry. There is no faith feeling that's coming. It's not coming because faith is a movement. It's a movement that you practice. And it's a movement towards a person, y'all. It's a movement towards Jesus. The I am was in the cloud and that cloud was moving for 40 years and he was drawing the Israelites to himself. But he needed the people to keep walking towards him in faith. So you may feel that emotional and that spiritual awakening during an appeal that makes you want to do more for God. And that's good. You may get excited and say that was deep after a good sermon or Bible study. And that's good. You may even go as far to cry and feel a real sense of repentance during a good song. But these are are largely led by our emotions. And faith is not an emotion. As long as we continue to need good sermons to be in tune with God, as long as we need a church packed with people our own age, as long as we need music that just does it for us, then we are no different than spiritual brats. Must have our own way at all times. Must be soothed by the things we see and feel. And if anything comes along that is more than what we signed up for, then we're complaining and we're crying. But God wants you to keep moving to him. He wants you to keep letting his presence and his word tell you what you have to do in every phase of your divine wellness journey. It was not the the giants that came to the Israelites that scared them away from Canaan. It was God who told the Israelites to go look at what was ahead. It was him who told them to go inspect the land. It is God who frequently places these obstacles in front of us. It is God who allows us to go to the cliff of our faith because he wants us to decide to believe that he will carry us. It was God who told them to see, to go see just how intimidating, just how impossible, just how expensive, just how embarrassing, just how steep the journey was to him. But God wanted to be chosen by them. He gave them an opportunity to practice a faith that moves, a a faith that walks. And I'm here to tell you today that God wants to travel with you. God wants to travel with you that he's taking care of the price of the ticket. That there was a ticket too expensive for you to pay. And he's paid that price, you all. He just needs you to check in. He's given you your boarding pass, but you've got to keep checking in daily. This is a line that you have to get in every single day. He wants you to go the extra mile with him. He wants you to see that you belong on that plane. He's not just bringing you to a better hometown, to a better house, a better car, a better GPA, a better boyfriend, a better position, a better outlook. 
He's trying to bring you to a place where the two of you can stay forever, for eternity. But he needs you to keep moving towards him. He needs you to leave the things he's saying to leave. To love the people he's saying to love. To lead in the way he's saying to lead. So you all, I, I have to say to you, keep embracing the vision. Neglect all pleasure outside of your godly purpose and start practicing a faith you walk. This, ju this journey to wellness will not always be pretty, but it is the only, it is the only way to Jesus. So right now, I just want to appeal to anyone who has heard the spirit of God speaking to them. Just drop a red heart in the comments and start praying to Jesus right now. If you know that you need to embrace the vision God has over your life and you haven't been living up to that vision for your life, that he's shown you truth, you've been rejecting it. He's been that cloud hovering over you, but you've chose to complain and choose your own way. If you know that you need to embrace God's vision for your life, go ahead and just put something in the chat, a red heart. Talk to Jesus right now and know that he is calling you to keep moving forward. the trouble of this world how the trouble of this world trouble of this world soon I will be done with the trouble of I'm going home to be with my Lord. No like to live again. I'm going home. I got a mansion over there. I'm going home to be yeah. with a mind.
My, 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 my. That was a word from the Lord. Hey, look, I got to... I need to go see a doctor about my toes, man, because they've been stepped on, crushed, destroyed. In fact, I have my notes right here. This is it right here, Dr. Howell. It says, embrace the vision that God has for me. Let go of complaint. Embrace courageous company. Have a spiritual mindset and let go of a slave mentality. Let go of temporary pleasures. Work to inhabit Canaan. Embrace the struggle and reject a faith that you feel because faith is not an emotion. I was blessed by that word, Mount Calvary, and I'm pretty sure that you were blessed too. Laquays, you got it next week, brother. That mic is on fire, bro. I'm glad it's you and not me. That mic is on fire. So so good luck, Laquays. Good luck. Um, but I was blessed by that word, Dr. Howell. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that was a master class in, 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 in wellness, black wellness, and, and, and having that mentality, you know, that winning mentality spiritually. Thank you for that word. Let us pray now as we close out our service for the day. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for sending this spiritual warrior, uh, this mighty woman of God, to give us a word today, Lord. We thank you for the charge that you have given us. We have the courage now to, to inhabit Canaan. We have the courage to let go of these worldly pleasures and to, and to embrace a, a, a community, to embrace a faith that is beyond feeling. And Lord, we want to pray for those who have been moved by this word for those who feel as though they want to act upon it, God. But the enemy's here, and he's now trying to, to remove the seeds that have been planted. He's trying to now discourage us from doing the things that you have give, given us permission to do this morning uh, through the word. So we pray that you will send your holy angels to, to stand around us, God, to shield us from the forces of darkness, and to, to pour out your Holy Spirit in our hearts and our minds so we can act upon your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.